This episode of This Agile Life has been brought to you by BrilliantAgile.com, providing agile and scrum training, consultancy, and personnel. BrilliantAgile.com. Done right, it's brilliant. Recorded Tuesday, October 2nd, 2012 in St. Louis, Missouri. This Agile Life, Episode 5. Wait, I gotta say this because it's messing with me and has been messing with me since we got here. The news. Uh, when is October forfeits? So October forfeits. <laughs> okay, that October forfeits. That was something cool that Google did. <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny. Anyway, so are we doing the news? No. Okay. <laughs> hey, by the way, welcome to this Agile Life. It's a podcast about Agile. Our host <laughs> and founder, Mr. John Sextro, is not here this evening. He's out doing cool stuff, but he's uh, wearing speedos, is what he told me. He's wearing speedos yeah, tonight. So I really? Told him I would whistle at hey, him John, send us a picture. So tonight you've got myself, uh, Jason Tice, and I've got a co-host here with me, Mr. Amos King. Amos, Hi. what are you doing? Uh, not a whole lot. Just uh, sitting here looking at October four fifths and being quite entertained. Um, looking forward to tonight. Had a pretty stressful last week and. Deployment time, new office, so it's really uh, nice to get away and just chat with some friends. So Amos has proposed a new idea tonight, and that being what we're going to call the podcast unstructured and unplugged. Ooh, the, so, the non-Tice podcast. Well, no, 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 no. So, <laughs> no, I I didn't set the structure here. Um, I created a structure for tonight based upon a pattern that we've established over the last technically six episodes. But to your point and to things that you bring up, a challenge, and this is a discussion in the Agile space, how much process up front is needed to actually get something done? Yeah, uh, I think that it depends on, on who you have involved and um, where, like, what are they coming together to do? So we come in here tonight, we don't have to look through this. I mean, we kind of make in front of some of the stuff on here and... Uh, I like that we have picks for the guys that are gone, but um, as long as we can come in here, we, every time we start talking, all of us, Lee, uh, Jason, myself, we come up with these really good conversations and we talk to each other about them, whether we're on the air or not. And so why can't the, why can't we naturally let these things happen? And why can't we do that with a software development team? Then the, the question I'll throw out there, what then allows us to be successful if we adopt that mindset? The parallel I'll throw out there, which is a struggle, is let's talk about the notion of an open space conference. And knowing that we actually one of the things we talked about briefly in the news here is, you know, we're from St. Louis. And just recently we had a, you know, a, we have a conference in town here called Strange Loop. It was a great conference this year. Um, lots of really hardcore tech topics, but even a few kind of even softer topics that were presented all, that I saw when I looked at the program. But that's a structured conference. You know, they do a call for papers. They put a program together. And there's a there's a structure. And then people see that they make a they make an investment decision if they want to go, and then they go and they get the information. Opposite to that is this you know the open space concept where hey we're just going to show up and figure out what based upon who's there what we're going to talk about and those events typically they're a little hard to sell and pitch if you know if you're trying to organize they're, one right they're hard to sell up front because people don't know what they're in for. But at the same time, some of the best user group meetings and things like that that I've been to is when you show up to the meeting and we're like, hey, we didn't really have anything on the schedule tonight. And you get somebody oftentimes that doesn't normally stand up to talk who will put themselves out there with some idea that they have. Uh, not always. You know, a lot of times the guys who get up and talk are also the extroverts who are willing to put themselves out there all the time. Um, but whenever you don't pre-plan, sometimes people start to feel like I need to contribute something now instead of someone else is going to contribute for me. Well, and I'll support that because it's that, that notion that, you know, and it comes from any anyone who's done facilitation work where if you put a structure in place and that structure doesn't have checksums whereby people who maybe aren't comfortable stepping up can step up, then they never will. And so by that notion of, hi, okay, I'm going to go to this conference. I assume there's going to be a program. There's going to be extroverts there. There are going to be people who want to show up because they do architecture work with 200 slides and try to present them all in 90 minutes. You know, there'll be those crazy people running around <laughs> that you can do that. But if those people aren't there and or those people have to compete 
with maybe topics that are a little bit less structured and maybe a little bit more relevant because they're more organically generated, that might sell. And I'm the guy that shows up and says, I've got an idea to talk about, but I hate slides. So if I do bring a slide, I'll have like one slide that says Amos on it. And I'll be like, that's me. And then I just start talking because I slides are a distraction for me and often seem to be a distraction for a speaker, especially if you're at some kind of open spaces conference where you don't know what you're going to end up talking about. Sure. Uh, even if you come prepared with something to talk about, you start talking. And at open spaces, questions seem to be a lot more encouraged than at just presentations, right? So you start to talk, and then everybody starts asking questions, and the rest of your slides become semi-useless. And you're well, they're waste because they're, they're scripted. I mean, right. they're, they're designed for a script. And the challenge is that, you know, I, I'll share, I really appreciate your viewpoint because that's very fresh. Um, and a lot of the folks that I circle with, they want more of, I'll call it the can pitch or the, you know, the very structured response. I guess it has something to do with that architecture thing. And the challenge is where the happy medium is. Another idea I'll throw out there on the topic is, you know, I, when I asked at the onset how we can be successful. I mean, we're doing a podcast here. It's on iTunes. It's on FeedBurner. It's free. So there's no, there's no, um, there's no cost to get the benefit from this this experience. I don't know if there's a benefit with any experience that we're in the room. Really? <laughs> well, I, I'm just I just have to reconcile that somehow that that comes into play. That you know, if you're gonna go to a conference, even if it's down the road, it's still gonna cost you know money. Either you you know you're t- taking your time away from whatever you're normally doing, or also paying for the conference fees to go to the session. Well, that, and, and, sorry uh, to interrupt, but no, go for like, it. Like you talk about paying, and this isn't just about conferences. Um, or money, but I kind of wanted to go with the money thing is this is the same thing. Like you talked about pitching a conference, um, that you pitch to an investor for or anything like that. So I imagine if you and I had people pitching to us for investments, first of all, don't come pitching to Amos for an investment because I don't have any money. But if I did, um, but you have I a viewpoint am, that's really good, I am though. probably far more likely to invest in the guy who doesn't come in with any slides, but he just starts talking and is passionate and wants to do something. Because you know what? I think that even if he doesn't, or she, or she, doesn't go with their idea that they came in and pitched, if they have a decent idea and it changes and evolves organically because of the passion that they have, they might go with it. Now, I want them to be a little prepared, right? But I, it, I, there are a lot of other people who would be way more likely to invest in the guy that comes in with 50 slides and market and studies. And a business plan. And a and business market plan studies, and all kinds of stuff. And product prototypes. And, and but, I, but I've seen those guys get burnt out just as much as the passionate guy. And I would rather invest in the passionate guy because I would rather work with him. And... and I get excited. If he gets excited, I get excited. If he puts charts and graphs up on the board, I'm a nerd. I like charts and graphs, but I'm not going to be passionate about it. So, Amos, I'm going to share that, and from the viewpoint I have and a lot of the work that I do, I, I mean, again, I really appreciate your viewpoint. I think it's very honest, but that's that's not a that is not a majority viewpoint. It's not it's oh, kind of not the way the world works. <laughs> so, so what's the train strategy? I mean, how how is that, you know, and and. You know, Agile is kind of a practice that, you know, it really focuses on empowering people. It, it really talks to that. And, and how does, how do we get out of, you know, working in a, you know, small Agile organizations to where you're trying to go and get funding to do a big project or to do something big where you get out of the small circle and you go in the big pond. And if you don't kind of walk the walk and talk the talk and bring the 80 slides, you're, not gonna make the grade. Uh, I okay. So, I mean, tell th- me. this is the wrong answer for for your question, but I I would go after the guys that grew organically anyway, and and didn't go after investors like bootstrap themselves. But okay, uh, I think that you come with a prototype instead of saying, "Look, I did all this market research, and so I know what I want to build, and I haven't built anything." I would rather you come in and show me something that you've built. Uh, I don't so, care about so the market demonstrate research. competency, and De- I'll go for that because slides yeah. don't work. De- demonstrate what you've done, like as far as to start solving this problem outside of market research, because like what uh was it Henry Ford, 
who said you can have any mod- you got to you got to tell people what they want right you you yeah you can have any color f- you, you can have any color car you want as long as it's black right right you can paint your engine any color you want as long as it's black yeah. <laughs> but he he said you have to tell people what they want so the guy doing the market research he's probably asking a lot of questions he's not telling people what they want he's not going to be the most innovative thing out there on the block more than likely he might solve a niche problem but he's probably not going to be the most innovative thing out there because he's asking people all over what they want instead of saying, hey, I found what you want, and here's why. Because look at Apple. That's what Apple does. I personally, I hate the iPhone. I think it sucks. But Is that uh, specific to the iPhone 5, or is that all the iPhones? And I'm a Mac head. I just don't like the iPhones. Well, it's cause, I, I mean, never have. What's your number? But, kind but, of a lightning talk. What, what, what's your number one thing you hate about the iPhone? Uh, <laughs> really? The user interface. Crap. Uh, I, By the way, well, you should okay, listen so to I really like listen the, to our sister podcast, uh, which I owe yes. yes um, I I liked uh, WebOS and the user interface in WebOS. I found it very intuitive, and I don't find that about the uh, the uh, iPod, iPad, iPhone. Um, it's it's not bad. It's not horrible, but I I just I think I found something that was a lot better and unfortunately was put on crappy hardware so it didn't go anywhere um but with the ipod people ask for all kinds of stuff and apple steve jobs at one point whoever is in charge of that now was like nope that's not what you want well, that, here's that, what you really want and he sold it to people that way and it worked out really well and what the new iphone came out and they sold like five million of them in the first day or before something people crazy. even saw it that's... right he, well and yeah nuts and because he told people what they wanted, he didn't wait for them to tell him what they needed. Because a lot of times people don't recognize their needs because they get stuck in those ruts where you're doing the same thing every day. We even do this in coding. We do the same thing every day. We make the same mistakes every day, and we don't even realize that we're making mistakes there, and we think we're doing the right thing until somebody points out to us why it's a mistake and where it falls down. And you're like, holy crap, I've been falling on my face for years, and no, I never even realized it. And... The phones are the same way. Like, somebody's using their favorite smartphone for years, and they never see anything else. And so they think that this is the way it is, and they don't realize all those little pain points that they have every day because they've just gotten used to it. Yeah. They've optimized their life around a suboptimized process. Correct. And it takes someone who kind of is in a mindset to say, I'm going to tell you what you need and be innovative and be passionate to, in order to get to that point. Lee? So how does that <laughs> how does that get back to process and architecture though? That's where this started from. So how does well we're, how we and, got to this and, was talking about <clears throat> making an investment up front to build a structure to precipitate a desired outcome. And to Amos's point, using the Apple analogy, Apple's done a great job of that. They've built an architecture. With specific reasons, they have governance to their effective because they have everyone saying they want X, Y, and Z in the iPhone. And, you know, somebody says no, yes, no, yes. And they make those decisions effectively. And even still making those decisions, they have 5 million people that show up to buy a new product. And I'd propose it's a rather high-end product. Even one that they sight a lot of them don't like. <laughs> but, like... So that's the so that's well-planned the whole, that, That's the wrap on that. He's talking about the planned out approach. And I kind of... Took one company with the planned out approach, talking about the not planning approach, talking about the passion, and and I think you end up with a lot of all of that when you finally develop the product, right? Well, and I think Apple, to be fair, is a hybrid. I mean, they they, they, they have a structure. I mean, they they have an architecture. They have they have a way of doing things, but at the same time, they also are very call them. I don't know if I want to use the term agile for them, but they are very reflective of the market and they are very responsive to change. From what I've seen, is they they architect the process in which they work, right? Um, so what do you mean by that? So we even do that here on our team. So um, I say we're we're instead of saying you def- here is how here is what the final product. Uh, uh, um, okay, I'm having a hard time putting this into words. Here is what your how your classes should interact in the end. That is not defining your process on how you work. It's defining your process of this is what this will look like in the end, period. Right? You, I don't think you can do that. I think that part has to grow organically. Right. But you can put in a process and you can architect that 
we are going to work by writing tests first. We are going to use Kanban. We are going to use story cards. Here's how we are going to work. And we as a team have a shared understanding of how that's going to work. And that still will grow organically, but you, you start out with, with something. And so it's really, so they, I, I, you still haven't answered Jason's original question though, which was how do you have some big idea, some big, um, product that you need lots of funding for? And how do you go out and make the big pitch if you don't really have anything more than maybe a small well, prototype? Well, the, the thing that I'm saying is that Best case. this is a the theme, a word that, again, I've been using now for six months, um, knowing architecture framework is a year for me, um, investment decision. So there is a direct correlation to, and this goes, again, this is where the first question I have for you is, how do we change this? Because right now the market expects that if you're making a big investment decision, there's big money involved, you can get a better outcome if you invest in a structure up front, be it a product, be it a conference, be it anything. And what we're saying here, and there's great examples. I know a couple a couple of episodes ago I was talking about the Wikispeed guys who were down at Agile 2012. They're a great example that, you know, they have a just-in-time structure since they're Agile, and they're competing with the big guys. They haven't won the market share yet, but they're competing. But they're one of the few exceptions to the rule. And are they doing a good job? Yeah, so the original question is how how do you how do you do this without a, a I'm asking you how what are the if you had an opportunity you were king for a day Amos and you could go I, I'm you, king every day it's, you're it's right you are king for the day <laughs> okay so you were the supreme dictator with ultimate governance control okay we'll change okay. it and you could oh, very <laughs> no, funny. Don't. No. no and and you could go and change the world knowing that you could go present talk to whoever you want to talk to to try to change the mindset of let's call it the investment community, be it or who would you, what would you tell them? I because I, this is the other thing, what this relates to man, what this relates to is he's killing me today. I can't even. That's okay. I mean, that, no, this these are these are great great well, talking points. And well, no, where and we are is we're talking about an. So I mean, I'm the, the just in time guy sitting here biting my tongue because I have no idea what to say just in time. Well, the other thing, though, <laughs> okay, so the other thing that's in the agile space is look at all the the people who are out there selling consulting services and such, specifically about doing an enterprise agile transformation. Because they understand that things are going to change, right? And I, maybe that, that's really the big thing is that when you do come in and you present, you need to present in the fact that things are going to change. We all know they're going to change. I came out with this idea. I want you to invest in it. Someone else may come out with something very similar tomorrow. And we're going to have to make small changes and tweaks in order to get us to a good place. But I am prepared to make those small changes and, and tweaks because this is what I want to do with my life. This is where I want to go. I'm not just here to try to get you guys to put some money in my pocket so that I can leave and go somewhere else. So I am here to be passionate and to solve this problem for people that I see. And even if somebody comes out with a product, I will still make a better product. Or do you you want to invest in the guy that comes in and So you're saying vision is what's important, not the architecture. Correct. And that's what I'm after. And I think that that's what the, I think a lot of really good investors, that's what they see. Um, I'm going to go back to it because it's a good nerd analogy. Are you but selling Apple, a vision? The guys that are originally invested in Apple, they weren't necessarily investing in a, in a product. There were computers and just people weren't really that into them. They were investing in passion and a vision that they saw in Steve Jobs. Um, cause without it, Steve Wozniak could have probably made the Apple, but guarantee it would not have gone where it did without the passion that Steve brought to the table. Well, so to attempt to close this out or just Steve, change, they're both Steve. or just change the jobs the, brought to the table, just change the topic <laughs> or to change the kind of build on the topic then. If we're going with the Apple analogy, we're talking about people and that's a great organization where the vision was, it was largely from a single player. Right. So can you have a vi- – so going back to our theme of the night, which is we're test- We're doing a test tonight because in life everything has to have a test. Is our podcast process, regardless of how structured it is, sustainable without a key, without a key player, which is- which John's not here? So the audience can let us know. They can but I'm to- still here, so it's okay. Well, everyone and can Lee's to- still here running the-, the board, so it's okay. Well, and actually I'll share that as I was thinking about this and we're rolling this without John tonight, my question was I think um we might be able to sustain the process without John, but – 
Lee, you got some, well, Amos and I would figure it out. It'd sound like, oh, it would, yeah. oh yeah. It would probably sound yeah. like crap. Amos but. taught me how to do this in the first place. So, uh oh. <laughs> uh, so maybe, well, so that would be the other test. So, so Lee will be taking a vacation sometime soon, probably. There you go. But, um, the question where I was going with that is, um, not coming back to me, to be completely honest. So, so look, I, Amos, you smoked me. Ha ha. <laughs> Actually, I have a question that, uh, relates to this that it seems to me that process is, is often put in place in order to um, remove the necessity for uh, well or to remo- remove the necessity for people that really know how to do their job. So competent well, individuals, people that are really good, don't need a process. They can do it without it. I think they still have a process. They do, but they can self-manage their process. They, uh, I don't need a I, formal architecture process for uh, for things that people do well anyway. That that you can, for so things that you I don't can have organically to impose grow. it on them. So hi exactly. hi I'm hi Lee I'm I'm a big enterprise. Rawr, hear me roar. So I want. <laughs> He's not a very scary <laughs> enterprise, is he? Rawr, I'm an enterprise. Hear me roar. <laughs> Get ready for the Halloween show. I think that was Mothra. <laughs> So, hi, Lee. He's got zero. Hi, Lee. I want to, you're awesome, Lee. I want to hire you to do this job. I want to hire you to make widgets. So, go make widgets. And then, Lee, guess what? I don't like you anymore. I want to fire you, and I want to hire Amos, and I want Amos to make those exact same widgets because I need those for other things in my supply chain. How do you do that without having that documented, well-oiled, architected process that we're talking about here? Well, that's my point, is that if you are going to completely change over brand new people and you want to to uh, repeat that process exactly, then you must have a process. Why do you want to repeat it? Why are, exactly. you, why are you letting that person go and hiring someone else? Because if that person, if you want someone to do the exact same thing. Don't change a thing about how you're working and do the exact same thing because I, you want robots. Okay, so this you don't want people. political discussion now because this it's a free market, guys. So Lee came online. Lee started doing stuff. It was great. We have a free market. We have you know open communication. We even do open source software. So guess what, Amos? You're a smart guy. You kind of figured out, hey, Lee's got this going on. He's doing this work for the big enterprise, and and he's got that going on. Guess what? I'm gonna come in. I want to take his. I want to take his business away. So I'm going to come in, and since we have it in some markets, there's I, it fair. It wouldn't last very long because I would be trying to charge more than Lee, so I probably would never be able to get. Started. Well, but but I'm, again, I'm pretty cheap. That's <laughs> I, again, I appreciate your honesty and your viewpoint, but there's a lot of people that, that think the exact opposite viewpoint, Amos. That said, that say, hey, if I could undercut Lee by just a little bit, I might get the work. And then guess what? They show up, and maybe they use the process, maybe they don't. But if the process isn't there, then how are they going to be successful? You're making the assumption that uh, that what you're trying to do is something that is repeatable. And the output uh, is equal. And the output is equal. Exactly. Yes, right. make because, widgets. I mean, because very simple. Right. Maybe, Software development maybe I is try not to charge widgets. the same as Lee, but oh, I change okay. my process, and my widgets take me three days shorter. I can get you 3,000 extra widgets every day. I say, so we'll do a fusion here. <laughs> okay, because one of the topics that I did put on to, into the structured outline for this, the, the very heavy, heavy, you know, brutal process that we use to prep our podcast every week, very, very expensive process, was that we talked a little bit about, about DevOps. So I'll agree that software, you know, software development is a unique practice. But let's say we have, we're building to a common kind, platform. Kind of, but even building widgets. Some people say, I, want, I can build widgets cheaper. And other people, instead of doing it cheaper, say, well, I can build them better. And other people say, I can build them a lot better, but they're more expensive. Um, so I think you have the same thing in software. Those, those so, are your choices. So, you so know, cheaper, you, better, faster, right? So are we proposing then that software development is, is, software development is a commodity activity? Ooh, um. Cause I would assert, I mean, I'll go first on this the one. Output since can kind of. No. I would yeah. assert it's not. No way. It's not. It's not a you virtual and I, commodity. You and I could both go and, and write the exact same software. Completely different. That's, yeah, that, Outwardly looks the same, does the same process, maybe even performs the same. But if you look at the code, it's going to be completely different. By the Who's, way, can you add a new feature? By the way, easy? the well, whole that, let's say let's say it's <laughs> equally equally well done. By the way, the sound engineer, senior all programming. Things. Yeah, you're right. The That's sound right. engineer. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So it's, this week's agile teaching tip of the moment is to remember: there's this thing called the whole team approach. 
To which Lee, the sound guy, just said, Amos, we could write code. Not thinking of anyone in the room, including the architect over here. Maybe he can write code too. I don't think so. Oh, code of challenge. Uh, Jason, it's been a while, but I, th- I think oh. he could do it. I think he could do it. Maybe. I think he would spell hello wrong in hello world, but be okay. I'd have to write a good test for that. <laughs> so the, before I had, when I had to reboot my brain before, the, um, the question I had for you, Amos, was we, we've got onto this talk, this track talking about Apple, which is a great discussion. Apple was a per, uh, Apple is an organization that has a vision that specifically comes from a single patriarch, one person, you know, Steve Jobs and, of course, everyone who bought into that. Okay. Give me an example of a vision that isn't tied to a person. Well, I, I think that they tied it to a person as a front man, right? And I think that Steve was kind of a benevolent dictator in, in reading his um, biography, but he wasn't the only one making decisions there. Um, Visions like that become culture to me. Right. That's what happened at Apple, is Apple created a culture from Steve, Steve's vision. And, and they're continuing that vision now. And Steve's not here. Well, I guess where I'm going for and thinking again, you're doing, you're doing anything kind of at the, I'll call it at the strategic level, where, oh, we must have mission, we must have vision, we must have goals and objectives, you know, kind of the, the, the classic six pack. We must know what our I lines are. I would rather of- you have a mission statement than an architecture diagram. Oh, sure, totally. And I don't like mission statements either. <laughs> but Because I think most of them are bullcrap, like I think most UML diagrams are. But what, what I want to get into is that if, if you're doing... So if you're doing a vision exercise and you don't have a person... You mean like better one, better two? Blinking well, no, your no. eyes? Hi. What's a vision exercise? Okay, hi, we'll lock the door. We, <laughs> Can we get a definition here? You know, maybe we should try this. We should do, you know, what's the vision of this podcast? I just come in here because it's fun. I'm thinking myself. I mean, this is where I'm. Uh, hopefully, when uh, I will be interested, maybe we'll have this as a follow up next time. I, I think Please. Sextro might have a different vision, but for the J6? For, for me, I agree with Amos. I've it's never just thought just about that because I guess I, I've thought about vision in a much more again structured mindset. Hey, we're an organization. We're a company. We're maybe a division of a company. We need to have a vision for what we're trying to get done here. And from that vision, we need to have a mission that supports it. And then the next level of fidelity is we need to have goals and objectives. And then ultimately we would have lines of business that we would map into those goals and objectives. And it would all be a one-pager that you can laminate and looks beautiful. And if someone shows up and says, hey, what are you doing here? What are you trying to achieve? You can look and you can say, hey, this is what we're trying to achieve. And you can use that to promote that culture. What I think Apple did very well is I'm sure they have that document somewhere. But then they they made it a commodity understanding of the masses because they built it into their products and the marketing that they used to drive those products. Right, and you you talked about all these steps in order to get to what are you doing here. And and for me, I guess I kind of do have a mission statement and and I live my work by this, is that uh, I want to make a good product. Um, I want to make, I want to learn and I want to help other people around me learn. And if I was going to start my own company, that's what I'd say. I would say helping you make a better product by providing you with smart people who want to learn and want to help each other learn. Because as a consultancy, all I have to sell are people. And the only way that we can get better is to make ourselves better. So we make ourselves better for you. And you just and wouldn't. Be done. And you would not advocate getting better by learning architecture frameworks. No. <laughs> So See, I, like, well, no, I, I, think, I actually, I, think this, I, this I would say back. it's okay to learn an architecture framework. I, I think that any learning that you do will help you out, but that doesn't mean that I think it's the best thing to do or that there it's the best exercise that you could do. Sure. Well, so here's, here's the issue. I, I think that Jason is right on and I agree with him when it comes to stuff like large governance practices, uh, business process analysis and reengineering. That's stuff that you need to do. Really, it has nothing to do with software. That's the type yeah. of enterprise engineering that those architecture well, that's frameworks en- do. I mean, it's business engineering or business design. Let's take the E word out of it. We should it, create so. a business engineering degree. Do they have that? Oh, engineering management. Never mind. They well, do. it's engineering Never management or, or anyone <laughs> who does the whole business, the BA track, you know, business administration. That's what you do. It's like, hey, let's look at the, I mean, look at the back office. So, um, I mean, in our facility. I tried, but she kept turning around. 
Well, I mean, I mean, in, all, <laughs> I mean, in the facility, that, didn't even get it. the facility that we just moved into, it, it's kind of funny because we actually have all of our tech staff are, as I've just observed, they're all over on one side and all of the back office is kind of over here. So that's because they don't like us. Okay, okay, but if we're talking about culture and vision and all that stuff, you know, that we want to instill and we actually want to instill it into our customers because we want them to get, you know, invest in this idea, this agile idea, which when you invest in it, you have to accept at the onset, you're not going to get a big structure. You're not going to get a formal requirements process and a governance board that, you know, takes eight months to adjudicate I'm really a decision. upset why when I walk out on that floor with all the developers here that I don't see a single customer sitting down with their team every day. I wish that more customers would invest in their development teams to the point that they have someone dedicated to sit here and work with the development team because I guarantee everyone I'm going to end up with a better product. See, and I can't relate because I sit down um, probably two or three times a day or, or I, no, you, you I do are, things with as my... As much as I don't want to go work out at Scott, you guys yeah, are I mean, in a very unique situation. Well, I mean, and again, that, what we're talking about here is um, Amos... I don't know. Oh, we should Amos, maybe beep out that Scott. Thing. Well, no, but Amos, <laughs> Amos you work at... You, we do projects in, in the office here and you work here remote from your customer. Right. Um, myself and Lee, you're kind of in a hybrid role um, where you, you work some off-site and some actually at the customer location... I work exclusively pretty much at the customer location. So I, I see them every day and, um, it's, it's interesting. So I don't have that viewpoint and they, they value the architecture work that we do and they ask questions about it. And Are they sitting down with developers? Um, no, not that, really. That's what Again, I mean. I, I do mean, architecture. I, the companies that I work at, I love it when, when I've worked at, at, I've worked at all kinds of companies. It's the same thing there. When I'm talking about a customer coming in and sitting with the developers, I'm not talking about the customer ha- has developers of their own that they come sit in here. I'm talking about like at, at our company. If I want to go sit down with the CEO and have lunch and, and bullshit for an hour, great. And when you're at companies like that, where the CEO comes and sits in with everybody else and hangs out with everybody else and doesn't put themselves on a pedestal, that they're too good, and you have to schedule meetings with them, and you're not allowed to say hi to them in the hallway because you're not even allowed onto the executive floor without your badge, that doesn't work. And I don't, I don't want to be at those companies, and I think the same thing. Those companies, in the long run, are less successful. And they can't make changes as quickly because the top doesn't know what's going on with the bottom. And it's the same way whenever we're consulting for another company. If they have people here, they know what's going on more. And being more agile, we're able to change more with their direction. And they are able to better direct us and change their mind immediately instead of tomorrow or the next day whenever we have a phone call or a demo. So, so on to that. I mean, building on that, um, going back to the Wikispeed guys, um, what is it? It's, it's the uh, – oh, there's a Deloitte. There's a Deloitte Institute for Emerging Trends or something that that studied the Wikispeak guys. And they – I'll take that as a homework item. I'll write it down over here to come back with that for like the next formally structured This Agile Life podcast where they did some really pioneering research kind of inspired by Wikispeak where they – once upon a time, we needed command and control style organizations to get stuff done and to achieve economies of scale. Now that technology has become commoditized, you don't need that, and there's a lot of data out there to show that the institutions that are continuing to operate in a command and control style mindset are some of the ones that are actually trending downwards and or from a financial perspective, which is what Deloitte looked at, they're the least profitable, whereas the organizations that are the most profitable and have the most vigorous growth observed are those that basically took the command and control and pushed it out the door and kind of embraced exactly what you're saying, Amos, is what we're talking about here. I don't, I don't know if you... But the challenge is there's a lot of really... I don't really pushed command and control out, out the door as much as pushed it down and allowed everyone to be involved in that command and control. See, that's what I propose. That's not command and control. That's 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 empowerment of all. That's, you know, a flat organization. I Yeah, yeah, So So they, they took the command... Well, maybe they took the maybe they took the control part out because everyone can command everyone else, you know, the ultimate matrix organization... And then the question is, who's really in control? Although no one really can command anybody else into that in that situation, right? I can't command Amos to do anything. He might decide that my idea works, and sure. he might agree with it and do it. But then again, he most likely well, that's pretty much it usually tell works. me I'm an idiot. Yeah, but that, okay, but <laughs> that works whenever you get a lot of smart people together, right? 
Or maybe let's Gee, keep, let's keep saying my, that this comes back to my process let, let's argument. Keep, let's keep saying that that there's there's a lot of smart people in this room because um, it makes me feel good. Hey, there's a lot of smart people in this room. Good thing there's only three of us. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's two smart people in this room. Oh. <laughs> Well, wait a second. The other and one's, again, an, archi- the the other one's an architect. I'm, I'm looking. Oh, and again, the whole team oh, approach wow. just went out the window. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's talk about some news. I got some great news oh, here. Oh, no, please. Let's not read the oh, news Oh, let's articles. talk about some no. news. Unless you have, like, one of those that you are just dying to read the 15 pages of copy that you wrote. I have uh, to laugh at that. We can say October 4th. Um, apparently, there's there's some DevOps days going on in Rome, Italy. There you go. There's the conference bug for the day. Yeah, and you know what, I'll put, actually I had a buddy who went to a DevOps days thing, actually was in Portland a couple weeks ago, and he's ranting and raving. So they, they do kind of a fusion. They do a just-in-time structure. So they put out a call for proposals. They kind of set their, their program maybe a few weeks in advance. But, um, they do some good stuff. So if you got all our frequent flyer miles, um, I mean, we're recording here. It's the 2nd of October. This thing's this weekend. It's in Rome. Go for it. So. That'd be cool. I wish I could go. <laughs> so I, I like that you have this Huffington Post article too about how to build an agile office like so well so we'll put so that in okay. my head so all, we'll, I, all i picture is you get a bunch of guys together that uh maybe programmers whatever and you get them together and you put them out in a field and you say what do you need and they go uh some walls would be cool <laughs> so you throw up some walls where do you want them right here okay that's great uh chair chair would be nice too Oh crap! We forgot to put in electricity. We got to tear this wall up and put some electricity. Like that's sorry, that's building an agile office to me. <laughs> As opposed to saying, what is the acceptance criteria for which the Huffington Post came up with five things? None of them, which were electricity, actually. Um, one, of, <laughs> one of them of note was openness. So you, they would actually say you don't need any walls. So um, <laughs> simplicity. But uh, I don't a know. Stick. So stick. Amos, okay, so out Sticks of the news. powerful. That was like my favorite toy as a kid. Sticks okay, and mud. so the news, the news sucked. Um, and of note, there were also, we'll put them on the show site. No, even when we, the, even there were when some we great good picks. news, there I don't were like great picks news. from CIO.com and also from Forbes. I, I would rather, instead of having news, if somebody wants, like, has some news item that they're really passionate about, either we discuss it or throw it in as a pick. Like, the, the news, I haven't got anything out of this. I would actually I got a like great to ask idea. This was like there's a hundred people that like this on Facebook, and 97 of them were my bots. So the other three of you out there um, <laughs> that listen to us, uh, it, we would love to hear like what you think of how we run the podcast. Uh, what are your favorite segments? What segments would you get rid of? Which would host, you get rid of any of them? Which host um, you get rid of? Which host you would get rid of? <laughs> Uh, please don't say me because I really like hearing myself talk. Um, well, the other thing that yeah, I... except for picks, picks are not up for grabs. I love picks because they help me find out new things. So, so, so you Even can kind of see never the way that pick them ahead of time. <laughs> you can see how how Amos uh, runs his teams too. It's um, we want input and we want to to do it exactly the way Ex- you want, as except for all these other things oh, no, that I are really s- me. I didn't say we want to do it exactly the way you want. <laughs> I mean, hopefully we have. Uh, hopefully, if we do actually have three listeners, I'm not sure we have that many, that they don't all come back with... If they all come back with the exact same, like, please stop doing picks, then we should stop doing picks. But I doubt that every... Well, now we, that I said... Are we doing market now research that I now? Said this, now that I said this, everybody's going to say, please stop doing picks. <laughs> picks are good, especially because they, they bring out the diversity of the group. So well, I, I thought The other we were, idea that I'm going to throw I there for we the were future... Taking the model, though, though, I think Jerk. we were taking the and model, though, go ahead, that, Wait, wait, wait. Go ahead, Lee. I've got one. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, but it's company laptop. Don't. <laughs> okay. Anyway. So I thought we were taking the model that we weren't going to do market research. We were just going to tell people what they need. <laughs> That's right. Tell This is what you want to hear. This is what you want to hear. Maybe we yeah. should read the news. Because we have a vision and we have an architecture and we have a very lean, optimized, orchestrated process with metrics and KPIs to confirm we're on track. I can't. <laughs> which, wow. Which metrics oh are those? What? Um, they're the ones that came out of my whenever, Six Sigma Demaic toll gates. Well, I think that we've hit the big time whenever the Huffington Post writes an article about us and how we're politically wrong or something like that. I don't know. Well, that should be <laughs> That's easy. easier to do than you Amos, think, Amos. Just we start just, talking. <laughs> we just need to keep saying Huffington Post, put Huffington Post in the show notes, and we can see that. Just, <laughs> we're being nice though. We picked the very put, put Huffington Post in our meta tags on our website. 
uh, yeah, <laughs> with with a few other things that might trick them. So the uh, other one well, that I'll throw out there is an idea that I think we should do. That's the wrong and kind of site, man. <laughs> and again, yeah, I'm both meta tags. <laughs> and I'm all about chaining. Hence, we'll encourage people to come back for another great this agile life experience. Is um, when Mr. Sextro gets back after the dust settles and he's listened to this and probably comes in with a sledgehammer probably wanting to smash some of us, we uh, we should have a retrospective. Like a real, no kidding, retrospective. Of- On the air? Yes! That'd be kind of <laughs> cool. That would be fun! And maybe we Can should- we actually call Matt Phillip and see if we can get him to come in and do oh, it? Oh, that would I think be we awesome. Because I... Okay, we so, have to have Matt Phillip come and visit, too, because then we can Matt, do the whole team. Matt, I'm sorry. I really liked you as a person, but I really didn't understand what you did for this company until after you were gone. Thank you, Matt. Just <laughs> Very well wow, said. I feel like I'm going to cry. Thank you. Thank you. <sighs> So we should have someone come in and uh, do a retrospective, and uh, we'll see what happens. Um, Of note, I know um, a few of us in this room, I think Amos is in that book. Um, I'm in the book I know, and I... Uh, I don't Which know, book are I we did, talking about? Well, I did, but there are the only 12,000 names in the family and, of Isochar, and if, so... And if, no, no, no. And if Mr. <laughs> Philip came to do a retrospective, what he would propose is that there are certain people who are challenging to facilitate in a retrospective because maybe they do facilitate and they, they might take over the process. As long as he doesn't try to play a game. I'm okay. Well, then I should do the retro and we can play an awesome game. No. <laughs> you can't. I don't think that you should do your own retro. We did that once before no, we can't. and apparently we got yelled at for it. Um, but although the best retro that I ever had was a team called Retro and we didn't have... This is not like a fish called Wanda, is it? No, uh, the team called a retro, not a not a team called retro. Uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, the team said the retro. Team called now. a retro. We said, hey, we need to have a retro right now, and we can go look for a facilitator. Best retro we ever had. We should talk about retros. Well, did you did you? Let's ask. I mean, not to get into that, but did you like use a facilitator? Did you like? Nope. You just pulled the all hands alarm and uh, we went into a room and uh, <laughs> only one did came out get and shot? Grabbed, <laughs> grabbed a marker and a board and started writing down things and um, there was actually a problem on the team that I think going in a lot of the team saw as a person and a single person on the team messed up but by the time we left that we had we we walked in and we said we're not going to target this guy. We're going to target the situation, and how do we solve the situation? So, who is we in this case? How did you the whole all team. come? Yeah, but obviously you didn't come up and all say, "Oh, by the way, we're not going to 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 out Bill because Bill would have been in the group and he would have." Wh- oh no, he you? knew exactly who we were talking about. Okay, he immediately so you, said you did he, actually explicitly I did, say I, I outed the whole situation. I okay. didn't name him. He said, "We're not here to talk about people. We're here to talk about this." Situation that's happened more than once, uh, and let's take care of it. And at the end of it, he, you could tell at first that he was like, they're in here to freaking attack me. And within five minutes of it, he was like, wait a minute, no, we're, no, they're not. We're actually here to solve a problem. And we came out, best retro I've ever had, and I wish I could repeat that every week. And we didn't have facilities. See, I'll share the, the retro, having, having done some networking on that, the, the, the way that the organization that all three of us work for, um, kind of does retros is, I want to put a little out there, cause this notion of the third party facilitator, facilitator, if anything, we have a little bit of an institutionalized process for how we do retros, and in a lot of other organizations, it's a lot more, to your point, Amos, it's just kind of as is, as needed, self-facilitated, um, almost, you know, working to keep it very close to the team, so there isn't this third party person that has to come in and, and then does something where they report back to management about what's going on, which, I mean, there's good there's good visibility from that information, but it does take some of kind of the openness away because sometimes people will hold back. I think you have to have kind of a little bit of all of that. But we should we should really talk about right sure. Well, on and that's one where I just I just know there's a big diversity, and, and I know in the military culture there's this weird expectation that like the commander, whoever's the we have right all the time when I was in the military. Yeah, but but they it's, didn't call it that. But it's yeah, hot wash. But it's driven typically by the folks that are in charge. We called it airman alignment, and it usually started with a hammer. Or a bat. Yeah, and it was. Yeah, <laughs> no, and, and it was. And it I was, knew that was coming. Yeah, but wasn't it? And I mean, this is what I've seen. And what, what kind of the government, you know, working in the government space, what they when they say we're having a hot wash, which is their kind of word yep. for retro. Um, they say it comes in and it's it's it goes or back an to after actions meaning. Yeah, after action report. It comes back to the the command and control mindset where the person who's in charge drives the meeting. And and I've seen a few of these where. I mean, like, whoa, they just came in and they said, okay, you did it, you did it wrong, you didn't do it my way, don't ever do that again, done. 
And, and, I think and that's like not a retro um, for every <laughs> that's good feedback, but every officer, high ranking enlisted military member out there, if you're doing that, you're leading your people wrong. And in the end, they won't work for you as hard. Just saying. Been there, done that, seen it happen. <laughs> so what should they do? I'll go get all my military guys to listen to your podcast. I, I told we we should. You want to talk about retros tonight? We can talk no, about let's retros. not do it. Let's, we'll, we'll get okay, some more. We, but we'll, we'll get a special guest. We should. Yeah, I'm just looking. We should have a retro on the air and then discuss retros during it or after or sometime. I think I think it should take an entire episode. A retro? A re- oh, yeah. We a can retro record two episode, absolutely. Two episodes in one night, not retros. One retro, what? one episode. What are you talking about? I have about? no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so did we ever come to conclusion on the vision without people? Because we talked a lot about how, and, and actually, as I mentioned, we just had... Can't have vision without people. Well, we, can a vision, my, my objective, and a lot of organizations have this idea, they, they invest in building a vision and mission and objectives. And one of the reasons why they say they should do that is to make the organization sustainable given changes, including the people in that organization. I think, the, I think creating, the, creating a mission or a vision statement is not about the actual mission or the vision statement. It's about the process of creating it. And it's really only about creating a shared mission or a shared vision amongst the people that went through the process of creating it. That Once they have that thing written down on a piece of paper, throw it out the window. It's not Mo- worth crap. Most of the people coming in don't even recognize it. And even if you force it down their throat, they don't believe it the same way you do. But I think your better bet is... If you have a couple of people and you know that you have a shared vision and you guys want to start a company, um, when you start hiring people, when you get to the point that you even need to hire people, don't do it until you absolutely have to. But when you get to that point, don't spend one hour or two interviewing people and then pick one of them. Um, spend three months, six months, find good people. Those people that already share your vision, because there are those people out there, and onboard them because they will continue to work. Is that hard really sharing a right? vision or sharing an attitude? It's an attitude. Well, I, that's what a vision is, really. In in the long run, I don't think so. I think it's different. I think a vision has to do with um, where we are going five years from now, three years from now, a year from now, whatever. Well, the one that I want to ask is, so let's let's do a hypothetical here. So suppose, you know, Lee and I are we're crazy guys over here. Um, Lee and I decide to go away. You guys away. look like a couple of crazy We guys. go away and we say, hey, we're going to go make a vision. Let's go make a vision and a mission and all that fun stuff. And we go make it. And, and, I think he's talking about smoking peyote in a tent. <laughs> so we go to something so, else, and so, I don't think two guys can do that. So okay, <laughs> That's my logic. well, no, okay. So, but things that big enterprises do. Okay, we're going to convene all the strategic leaders, and we're going to have a strategy session. So then the strategic he said leaders a lot of go big off, words, and I know what they mean. I'm just not sure what they mean together. Well, no. So then the strategic <laughs> leaders go off, and they have a strategy session, and all of a sudden we have a new mission, we have a new strategy, we have a new that, vision. That That's, you just said the leaders go off and do that, so you never involve anybody underneath That's, they may not necessarily come along in that mission with you they may tell you they will so that they yeah. can continue to get a paycheck from you but they're not well, so that's what i'm asking Amos. so you. so again agile organization whole team approach big big question in the market right now how do you scale agile so some folks say go off have the strategic council get together write the mission write the vision make sure it aligns to the business it shows up. Where, hey, Amos, you, where, where is our vision? Scaling where, a, agile? And where are people not scaling agile? That's what I don't understand. Because if you wait for that question and you wait to answer the questions that you need to answer, like how do we get bigger, until the moment that you have to get bigger, you have the most amount of information at that moment in order to make that decision. And I have never seen anybody that hasn't been able to grow as an agile company uh, or as a uh, or grow a piece of software agilely. So I'm I'm not sure where, like you said, what does scale mean? Scale means that make the organization where where agile agile is successful at the, in small groups because there's a lot of human factors in play that facilitate the process because the process occurs just in time. What is a small group? Because when I got here, I thought we were a small group, and we've doubled in size. So are we still a small group? Since you had since I got here, probably tripled. No. Uh, 
five years. Oh, okay, 70 never mind. You must five have, people you to got here 150 just, people. Yeah. Yeah, you got here just before I did then. Yeah. I can be, I can I, be, and I think, I can be a tripler over here. So and, I, and I think yeah. part of that goes back to where I was talking about when you're hiring people on, when you're bringing people on and you're trying to grow. If you're talking about scaling that way, then like I said, is I think that you need to spend more time investing in your process of onboarding people um, well, the, sustaining... and your, your, your process of finding people because you need to make sure that you're finding the right people. And there is no way that you're going to find that out in an interview or two. I think that our interview process is way too short here. But at the same time, our interview process, if, if we, ideally for me, I would like to spend a month or two talking to different people and having those people come back in at different times. I'm not saying they need to be here every day or every week, but talking to these people in different situations, different times, I'd like to take them out to dinner. I'd like to take them out to dinner with their significant other so that I can better get to know that person and know whether I want to onboard them onto my team. It's not feasible for most people. When they're out looking for a job, rarely do you get somebody who's out looking for a job because they love their current job and it just happened to fall in their lap. There was another job and they thought, ah, what the heck? Because those people don't mind spending four months, right? Or a lot of people you get, they don't have a job right now. Something happened. They're, they were working in a company. The company closed down. They're out looking for a job. They can't spend four months. They don't have the money to spend four months talking to you. So or a month. Sometimes so you're they need a job that, next week. Well, actually, I'll, you know, it's interesting. Um, so from, what was it, from Agile 2012, there was a, I went to a session that was by a little company called Menlo Consulting. They're, out of, they're up at Ann Arbor, Michigan. They um they had a really progressive. He's high... got a hell of a mind. There was no way I would have remembered the name or where they were from. <laughs> Again, yeah, it's, it's it's an architecture thing. But they they have a great thing where they actually um they come out and they do like a call it a free well, I don't they actually it's like an interview boot camp where they actually bring people and they play they do like simulated pairing and planning exercises where like they have you know two complete strangers sit down and they pair doing like iteration planning and they observe teamwork and camaraderie and they have people get it. Um, I'm kind of scratch pants saying that, you know, some of the folks I work with, if I said, yes, you're going to go through a simulated agile estimation meeting, you know, working with someone to come up with how to estimate stories, um, you're assuming that the people have, the people who are interviewed have context as to what that is. Um, since I work in a very, my background, I work with a lot of very diverse staff. Not everyone would know what that is. So, but it's really cool because they actually do that. They, um, they do it in the evening. So it has a social factor to what you're saying, Amos. And then they actually, from that, they actually do kind of a callback where they put people into an hourly work program where they have NDAs with their clients, where they can bring people in provisionally, they can work, and if it works out, then they bring them on. And I mean, there are, See, and there I, are real progressive credit, because again, transparent salary, everyone knows what everyone else makes. Um, people actually, they vote for compensation adjustments as an entire company, so... Um, that's, that's really, really kind of cool to me. Really like, progressive. I, I mean, I like that. Type I think of stuff. I read about something like that yeah, from there's a Ayn couple, Rand. There's a couple people GitHub doing that. stuff like that too. GitHub, <laughs> everybody at GitHub makes the same amount of money. Everyone. Cause yeah, I mean, they want to take money off the table. I think that's brilliant. Um, but you, you talk about them spending some time with them. The other thing when you're interviewing those people, you, you talk about little exercises that they do and things. It's hard even if somebody comes in and pairs today for an hour and an hour yeah. next week and an hour the week after yeah, that I mean, to get much out of them, even if they came in for an entire day. Because really, the hard part about software is sustaining it over time, right? So I need, if I really want to get to know somebody, I need them to build a product and have maybe something, the same go kind of thing in, on 10 different pages. And I need to say, oh, let's say it's a website. I have... Uh, buttons. Every button on my website that every link on my website I want to look like a button, right? So they go through and they make all of these links and do all this stuff and they spend time making this big project where there's 500 of these links and they all look like buttons. And then I come in and I say, hey, um, I want this type of link to look, still look like a button, but that type of link to not look like a button. I want it to look like highlighted blue text because that in how they organize their software and how they work in order to get to the original point will allow them to change that either quickly or it'll take them time. And things like that allow me to see more of who you are. And this is a really contrived example here. Um, but that to me and your personality is what's important. And I can't get that feeling from you in an hour or two pair session and an hour talk. And then 
they come to me and say, so should we hire him as entry level, uh, mid level or senior level? And I'm like, uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I can't, I can't judge that. I have no idea where he is for real. So we do, when we hire people, we usually have, uh, for developers, have them go through and create some, uh, some code uh that's moderately structured there's usually a site that our hr person sends them to uh and they can choose certain certain uh things to do it's like computer science courses all over yeah it. yeah but, it is. but, it is. but Which... what if what if we had something like what uh amos is is talking about there that we know would require a certain amount of of good architecture practices uh when oh. creating their well, I... <laughs> When creating I mean, their code, and then come into the interview with Amos, and uh, and he says, "Oh, now change it." Well, the the other one, or that, I broke it. You wrote five thousand lines of code in your program; it's broken. Fix it, and I and I break it because that's the other thing that people fail with. But hmm. but but I mean, we we got over that's into tech. Contrived, we got over into technical stuff, right? Yeah. But that's sorry. where people fall apart. Is is most of the time is troubleshooting. That's where they. Start to break down. They start walking out. They start screaming and yelling. Is whenever they run into a bug. But we got into the technical side where I was talking about with the interviews originally, where I was trying to go and then went to technical like I always do. Um, is that we don't know people well enough, and I think we move too quickly, and therefore we have to have more architectural process of hiring in place. In order to make sh- and things like mission statements and trying to jam mission statements down people's throats and making sure that they have certain understandings of how we expect them to work because we didn't spend the time up front to make sure that they already have that drive, that passion, and that understanding of how we work and who we are. And if if we spend more time there, they can make a better decision on whether they want to work for us, and we can make a better decision on whether we want them to work for us. I mean, so the key to Agile is having good people. I, I, yeah, totally. Yes. totally. I mean, and the simple thing that I throw out there, you know, that even for the current organization we're in, you know, we're, you know, we're in kind of a growth mode, but I know lots of people in the agile development space are in the growth mode, are in growth modes across the country. What if you, you know, pick, to get the client factor out of this, you know, and I mean, Amos, we can't have folks show up and sit down and pair on your stuff with you because they are not employees who knows what they're going to do, but pick an open source project. There's lots of them, tons of them. And sp- instead of coming in and asking questions, hey, what do you want to do? What what are your career objectives? And, and this comes from a guy who's got a career coach just for fun where, I mean, I could whip out my portfolio. I've got documented career objectives that I've invested in that I'm trying to meet. So it, I would you, love to see that someday. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that's a cool thing. Yeah, right? I mean, it works for me. Some people hate it. So. I've told people, people ask me, how do I how do I get hired at Asynchrony? And I said, well, um, I've seen you at one user, user group meeting in the past two years. Uh, I've never seen you make a commit to open source. Um, I've never seen you make a suggestion about anybody else's code whenever we've been sitting around talking about code. Like, so well, that's no, what because, I was gonna... because we have a lack of time in order to talk to people, I avoid wanting to interview people that I don't already see out and about. Like, if I see your name and I'm like, holy cow, yes, this guy goes to the user groups, this guy has conversations, this guy has sent me a pull request on this project or anything like that, I am far more likely to want to talk to you and get you on board because I already have an understanding of who you are, where your passions lie. So would you would you use something like a work for pie model um, if you're not familiar with those I guys? I don't know about work for pie. Okay, Is so, it an architectural thing? No. Okay. No, it's not good. Let's talk it's about it. It's an incentive system. It's an incentive system. Do you want to explain That's, it? Or I'll let you take it, Lee. You brought okay, it. so uh, Work for Pi is a company that allows people to create profiles on their website, and you put in as part of your profile your GitHub address, your Stack uh, Stack Overflow IDs, that kind of stuff. And or, they basically create a, a pie chart of and a number for how you know, good a developer you are. I don't are. think I don't uh, my think, stack overflow uh, how, is zero. I don't even have an account. It was funny. <laughs> One of the guys here at work called me out and was like, "Yours, I bet my stack overflow score is higher than yours." And I said, "I bet it is." I don't even have an account. And he goes, "Wait a minute." I searched for your username, 
and stuff came up and I said, well, it's not me. And he went and looked and it wasn't usernames. It was people referring back to me as the <laughs> answer. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I was say the other thing that, um, and for someone who, anyway, who knows if they, really cool. I mean, you know what it is, Amos, and you have, you have a viewpoint on this. It's the Incentosaur. The Incentosaurus. Whoa! Yeah. Did you ever see the Incentosaurus? No, I've never seen he, the Incentosaurus. So, he, he didn't, uh, he didn't cross, but it's, Mr. Mike Gaffney and I, um, worked together on the Incentosaur, which was gamifying the Ruby community. Where you got points for blog posts, comments on blogs, <laughs> it's, uh, it's the same comments thing. on lines of code on GitHub and GitHub mm-hmm. commits, and then Coder Wall came in. Like we were just playing around a long time ago, a long time ago, this is five, six years ago, and Coder Wall came in, and they basically have done what we had done, which we stopped a long time ago, and they had a formalized they... architecture, and they won. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. I'm going. Un- I'm un- going. <laughs> I'm going to bed. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> um, uh, well, we they we, did the business. Of the market. They, they were trying to do, I think, more with it than we were. We I think were they had a more like, formalized vision. They had, we were they had a You know, Mike Gaffney and I. There yeah. was no way that this thing was g- gonna become something big. We were just. It was really about whether I could get more points than Gaffney. It was not about anything else. And so we yeah, would add but, features in that would try to get us more points than the other person. Okay, but you know, but the other thing about this, and maybe a way to close this out tonight, is we I now, we, again, this has been an interesting discussion, because what have we done? We've had scope creep, and we've added to our backlog for the future. We could make a movie, Backlog for the creep? Future. Backlog to the Back Future. To well, <laughs> broke backlog to the so future. So the other oh. thing, uh. let's, um, <laughs> for the future, we got to get the, we got to get the marketing. That's going to be my pick. Wait, no, wait. Broke back to the future. Have you seen that? <laughs> we we got to get the marketing and sales viewpoint in here because the marketing and the sales viewpoint, their processes and the, the environments that they have to go into are highly structured. And what we're talking about is they need to be highly unstructured and very dynamic and, and very lean, which is great, very efficient, but that's hard to sell. Uh, all about this, everything that we've talked about tonight comes down to me to the same thing, is put off answering whatever problem it is yeah. until the last possible minute. Because the answer will be way more clear. Hiring well, people. Put it off until you absolutely have to hire that person. Like, if you want to hire somebody, say, hey, are you out looking for a job right now? And if they say no, maybe you spend a little more time just getting to know them. The How problem, do you the manage problem is a- <sighs> we, we have this issue, though, uh, at um, the I other place that we work. I love your purple shirt, by the way, Lee. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the other place that we work... Um, we have an issue that they didn't actually do enough upfront, uh, considering of what they were going to need down, down the line in the future. They were trying to do the wait until the last minute. And so now they don't have some of those infrastructure pieces they need that are going to make things work, uh, in a, in a more efficient way. Um, identity management, well, uh, well thought out identity management services. Um, Policy decision points. Yeah, but that's where they're, but in that environment, even there's still some inherent inefficiencies in some of the, there are some I, inherent there are a lot weight more states that there, slow yes. things that are non-value add weight states to use process. In, in other environments, could you have gotten those things quicker when you needed them? Oh, absolutely. Because, well, or, but, yes, if you're in an environment that, that moves like, like mountains turn into sand, then, Yes, you're going to, you're going to have to do the, that decision point is actually the, the last possible moment of decision is, is pushed back. And that it really is that they didn't wait until the last possible moment that they needed, to, when they needed to make that decision. They needed to make that decision a long time before they did. They just didn't recognize it until the last possible minute. Yes. I but would agree. Actually, with they you. didn't recognize it until it wasn't just a little problem. It was a big problem. Right. I, I would I would agree with you completely. It seems to me that that what happened is exactly what you said. It's it's not about recognizing when you need it. People recognized it. It's it was the fact that that uh, they they were trying to put it off even further. Oh, we can actually still well, get around this. So the and, and once you once you start trying to get around it, it's probably a good idea to start looking for the solution. So I'm going to give my my colleague Amos here. Actually, Lee, Lee you've seen this, um, and I unfortunately can't whip it out right now. But um, whoa, 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 whoa. zip it back up. <laughs> that zip could it be back maybe up. that's the podcast house. I can't whip it out right now because I don't know where. I, I was thinking. I was thinking. Uh, um, 
topic potpourri. Well, no, what I want we've been all over the place. But what I wanted to challenge you to, and actually, I'll send you the reference because this to me is an architecture. Um, it's the from Dean Leffingwell. It's the Scaled Agile Framework, ScaledAgileFramework.com. It's a completely interactive website where it's actually an architecture. And what he talks about is there is this notion of these infrastructure epics that need to be put in place to support the agile development work that occurs at a lower level of the architecture. And what the whole notion of the scaled agile framework is, is saying that you have to do that cross coordination between operate, between the more operational infrastructure pieces. And you should use agile to build and test those too. But that whole ecosystem needs to be coordinated. Oh my so. God. Everybody go out to scaled agile framework.com and you will exactly see who Jason Tice is. Look at this, Lee. <laughs> Wait, do you think that that I've website that. explains I've Jason Tice? I've seen that Tice? diagram before. Does that explain Jason Tice? Like well, the fact that he, that's he great, seemed excited over this website? That is a great <laughs> diagram, and that's a real picture. <laughs> see? And, see? And again, see? At, but at the enterprise level, that's a real problem because enterprises don't what, coordinate they're, that they're very looking, well. They're, they're looking at these diagrams or... Well, the, I generating mean, them. This is a that's a that's a notion of how a, the agile ecosystem should work. What the what I've actually also used that diagram for on that website, skilledagileframework.com, is saying that this is an example of what an architecture product should be. So don't put your architecture in stateful paper-based documents that then you have to read. Make it because if you go Instead, to that website, colorize them and put pictures on. Them. Well, no, I mean Amos, <laughs> that whole thing's interactive. Click on it, you can get. I mean, I, it, yeah, it's a fancy website, but it, it it's more than paper. So it's it's again as an architect, I take my steps in a baby baby steps. Hey, what is this DBT thing down at the bottom? Is that like two douchebags or TDB <laughs> D, DBT? Is it douchebags technical? Um, I'm uh, waiting technical for the uh, bags. I'm, I'm not, I think I've lost my network connection. So. I think you've lost me because now I'm like, I gotta go click on these things now that you said that I can Are you click mesmerized on. by the, um. Not really. I'm afraid to touch anything on here. He's afraid right. to be like most things that are by the way too over architected. I'm afraid if I click something, it'll break. Amos, if you, <laughs> Amos, you should learn the details by this because that's a, and we, I will, I will. The, I'm, gonna, um, I'm gonna leave it up here for when I have better internet connection. Well, it, yeah, cause mine's screwed up too. But, uh, you know, on the rundown tonight that we didn't get to, I put some notes out there about DevOps, um, how that fits into Agile, kind of a weird thing, cause you can have the, and going back to the scaled Agile framework, you can have the most optimized development build, you know, development cycle, but then if you go over into some waterfall for integration and release and infrastructure, What's the point? So I know uh, like on episode one, we talked about is continuous integration an agile practice? And we had an interesting Depends debate. on what your definition of is is. Well, you can say is DevOps or Agile Ops. Is that, you know, how does that fit in? As we never got there. So um, so should we wrap it up with some picks? Sure. Hey, what's your work for PyScore? What, mine? Yeah. I don't have one. Shame on me. Uh, it took like 30 seconds. You should go do it. What's yours? 39. And all, and all I hooked up was my GitHub account because what's yours? I think I, I don't know. I've got account. I've got a GitHub account. Well, I haven't I haven't put in my GitHub account or my Stack Overflow, which is pretty lame. Yeah, I wouldn't do too well. I'm trying to put in my Hacker News account. Well, you said you didn't put in your GitHub account. I did not. What account do you have in there? Any? Um, I don't even remember. It's been a while. Because I I know that my score is going to me too. Suck. My youngest is like five years old. Four. <laughs> She's almost right. Yeah, but see, but Lee, you do it a lot has of work. Been a while. Lee does a lot of work <laughs> with the the, the LifeRay platform, Life from LifeRay.com. I mean, open source. It's a web portal platform. So, granted, I don't know if they actually where do they manage their source. It's not on GitHub. It's in their own. It's repo. not in GitHub, but they do have a Git repo that you can hit. Yeah. So, so the question is, if you push to that, would it show up in your score? No. Yeah. No. So, all right. So, Amos, you thought it was the best part of the podcast. Let's do some picks, man. So um uh, I'll let's see here I will um uh, so Mr. Sextro's weighed in here did his homework that I asked him to do uh, since you know the Mr. Uh, rigid Process guy here and he had uh, put an oldie but a goodie a book John Sextro yes he's yep. an oldie but a goodie no he picked an oh. oldie but a goodie <laughs> book by Mr. Robert Martin great guy Mr. Professionalism and talking about agile software development principles patterns and practices that is a mouthful. Well, it's a book. I like the alliteration. Is it ask to pee? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so, I've read it. Good book. Anyone else read it? No. Once upon a time, that book was needed to establish terms and definitions, but 
Uh, what's interesting is as the markets become more colluded right now with everyone talking about Agile, including probably the three of us in this room, not helping since, you know, we're not, uh, we don't necessarily have the most standardized terminology across the community. It might not be bad from a structured architecture format to adopt some standard terminology and use that. And that book does a great job of setting some standard terminology. I, I, yeah, I think that works. I think that the the biggest thing is that you need to have a shared terminology. I don't care if it's officially written down. If you have enough conversations, you will come to a shared terminology. But how do you scale that? Carefully. That's tough. Only when you absolutely have to, at the last possible minute. That One you have conversation to make a at a time. That's right. I, I'm I'm <laughs> struggling to say how that scales. I mean, you know, sometimes I just say stuff to try to rile up dice. So, yeah, but I, I sidebar on that. So if we're rolling, you know, so suppose we we get an epic new project tomorrow. It's awesome. And we also then epically am hire... I, am I on it? Yeah, and I'm on it with you, too. It's going to oh, be awesome. Bet, wait, it was, it was epic and awesome when I was on it, and then you added Tice. Okay, so Tice... And now it's just awesome. So Tice and Amos are on this epic <laughs> new project with epic funding, and guess what? We need to go hire 30 new people, and we need to hire them within a week, and we need to start working and be effective by next... It's Tuesday. By next Tuesday. How are turn, you and I going to do that? No, I would probably turn it down. Because you'd be like, it's too big, too fast. Too big, too fast. It's going to fail, and I don't want to be involved. And, see, that's and even where, if it's not going to fail, it's not the, who I am, and I don't want to be involved in that. I'm not after the epic amount of money that they might have. It, there would have to be something really enticing to get me to stay after you've said that. I'm just... I mean, that that's the reason why the fact that the Azure... It's community, true. I'm yeah, being but, completely honest. But the no, fact was, that the I Azure... I was just thinking of uh, indecent... It, it, Indecent proposal. Okay, but oh, jeez. Now we're in the guy showing your age. <laughs> when did that movie come out? I remember that movie too, Lisa. Do you remember, so do you remember when they invented the wheel? I, we, made, we made fun of Craig. It was a hexagon. But no, okay, that, yeah, that's... Yeah, Craig, Craig. <laughs> Today, so, we, Craig's leaving. So we made fun of Craig about how old he is. I, I have to jump in here with this while it's on my head. My, poor, so he said. And we got here from John's Craig. Craig, oh Craig my goodness. invented the wheel, but uh, the reason he didn't get credit with for it is because he screwed up and gave it the wrong name and called it the square, and then nobody wanted to buy it. Anyway. <laughs> in closing, what I'll share, and maybe Mr. Martin will hear this, is at least my viewpoint, is that the reason... Does Bob are, Martin listen to our podcast? It would be really cool if he did. It would be really cool if he did. Hey, Bob, if you're listening, there, we would love to have you on. There's a product to be made, or there's money to be made for someone who can answer the how to how to get the new team with a whole bunch of new people up and running and effective in a very short period of time. If because, this is the same Bob Martin that I know and I've heard talk, he will answer that with a question that will just confuse the shit out of you even more. Yeah, no, and I then agree. he'll laugh about it. <laughs> no, I agree, but but that's a that's a big problem right now to say how do you how do you kick start a team? Because that's what the people are saying. That and that's why they say agile won't scale. Because Amos, you and I can't I say you can't bring in 30 brand new people that don't have a shared culture and don't have a shared, oh my gosh, vision, um, or attitude and expect that to work. And you don't know in a week, right? And you don't know. You could bring on 30 people if you already knew 30 people out there and just went to them and said, look, I have an epic amount of money and I'm going to give you this. I can give you about 10 of those people that I know and, and I could probably hire 10. You have to have a, a critical is, mass of people. Is, that, yeah, more. The thing is, I, I got I a big like budget. Working, I like working with you, Tice. And I imagine that you could find 10 of those people uh, that you know and trust. I couldn't imagine working with 10 people that are like you, Tice. <laughs> <laughs> Amos, I could make that a reality. No, I, 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 actually, I actually look for people who are quite a bit different than me. Yeah. No, there's good. There's uh, good I want people that. who are going to challenge me and call me an idiot. Uh, because I, it's so much more fun when I prove them wrong. <laughs> there aren't enough people like you to make a team. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, a team of Amos's. All three, right. of, all three of us work here, too. <laughs> so that's John, that was one of John's picks. Um, so the other one that John threw out there was to follow Ron Jeffries on Twitter. He's at Ron, R-O-N, Jeffries, J-E-F-F-R-I-E-S. And he provides excellent commentary on Agile and is a prolific tweeter, which must mean he tweets a lot. I don't need... I think he's. I'm following him. I really don't need people who tweet more. Well, and they because it, I already can't. And get they're also all the stuff on they're superfluous. He tweets too much. I, I yeah. <laughs> Do you really need to know what people get at Starbucks in the morning? No. Well, stop taking pictures of your food. Stop telling me what you got at Starbucks, and I don't care that you're pooping. <laughs> okay. Did you actually get that? Now, if you try on this really nice 
cute short skirt. Go ahead and take a picture of that and send it to me. <laughs> well, I don't let my Or if it's this, like, I don't know, football pants. You know, in the event we actually have listeners of the other persuasion. Football pants. I don't know. Like football span- pants are spandex. not attractive. Well, from your viewpoint, Amos, but if you're an architect, you send- have to consider hey, the viewpoints so, of the enterprise. So send him a picture of your moose knuckle. That's what he's saying. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I don't even know what so, that is. You know, Amos, a while back. I'll explain that to you later. Uh, a while back, and actually, we uh, but uh, another. Have you, wait, wait. You know, we have you ever ki- seen? Have you ever seen the movie Labyrinth? Yes. You know David Bowie. Yeah. He had a moose knuckle between his legs in that movie. Okay, got it. <laughs> Thanks. And with that, I'm going to create a new architecture framework called the Frat House Architecture Framework. We're going to have reference models to track parties and alcohol. Hey, and- hey, it's called a fraternity. You don't call your country a f- do you? Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. Oh. You, what? You better beep that one. <laughs> beep that one. Beep that, that is one. the worst word ever. And I, oh my. No, goodness. this is something that I used to say in college because I said there are fraternities and there are frats. And when people would call it a frat, I would get a little angry. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> I will tell, <laughs> Amos, I will update my lexicon to reflect your viewpoint. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. So Amos, <laughs> as usual, we haven't followed but the you rules. were actually, you were going for frat house. Because yeah. you were going for stereotypical animal house craziness. Right? Oh yeah, and, okay. I, and I have a I have a bit that I've worked up. Um, anyway, specifically your... for architecture. No, we're not doing it now. Oh. Uh, we have way too much content. We got to cut this down. It would be it will lure people. We'll talk. We don't about, have to cut this down. We'll talk about the. This frat is a house. bonus episode. It's two and a half hours. Enjoy. Because <laughs> yeah. we don't have John here to stop us. We'll talk Woo! about the frat house. Yeah, he always wants to move on. Well, everything has a time stop box, doesn't on, it? John. Stop moving on. Everything has a time box. Yes or no? No. No. I'm Something not... shouldn't have a time box. We can save the frat house architecture. My framework. life doesn't have a time box. I mean, my goal is to live forever. So far, so good. <laughs> we should. I'll put that on my list. Okay. <laughs> so the problem is, our listeners might have a time box. So we need to be mindful of that. Of course, in the pocket, just pause it. So that's right. It's not broadcast. Okay, I'll forget that. Sorry. Listen to it on your next ride to work. Of which we all have lots of those. So, okay. So this will only take one ride to work for me to listen to the whole thing unedited. Just saying. So I got a couple I'll throw out there. Amos, you can chime with yours anytime. Just shut me up. So, um, everyone in the room's got kids here. So there's an interesting blog out there about becoming an agile family. Do they have a Kanban board? Yes, they do. They've uh, had a yes. Kanban Christmas. Do they have retros? Uh, they kind of had a thing about a family meeting. I tried to have a retro with my wife once. It was not. Not a good idea. Sometimes you do need facilitators. <laughs> yeah. I think it's called a lawyer. <laughs> well, no. No, no. no that's <laughs> an arbitrator. We're not to that point. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I, uh, my wife and I get along very well. Um, uh, just as long as I make sure that everything that she does, I tell her is right. <laughs> no, I mean, okay. the, the, but Sorry, the, honey. A thing that I'll share, <laughs> and part of the reason why I've known about the Agile family, the Agile family blog for a while. It's interesting. It's been kind of a, in our organization where all of us work right now, we've had some other people who I know have tried the personal Kanban at home, done things. The thing I've actually found value to it within the, my recent activities is we're trying to teach a very diverse group of, of folks how to do simple Kanban. And so, you know, when we're doing dev and we're thinking about incremental commits back to, you know, GitHub or whatever, you know, it's amazing what those of us in the dev circle, and I'm going to attempt to put myself in that circle with Amos can push me out the window here. Well, we, you notice that Lee and I sit on the opposite end of the table from you. Yeah, I know, and the window's over by me. Um, <laughs> but anyways, those of us that work in, in the dev circle, we think in small slices. You know, we're, we got that. But people that don't do that, it's it's amazing that you say, okay, how how can we make that smaller? How can we, you know, what are the discrete acceptance criteria to say this thing's done? And He didn't have to say discrete acceptance criteria in order to get his point across, but he did. That's how you know he's an architect. Use big words. Okay, I got that. I will take that as a lesson to try to not use words. But I hate to say this, but my takeaway is try some. You know, if you're trying to do combat work, if you struggle, if you find that you know there's someone on this team on your team named Amos who is always bothered because you're moving cars all over the board. Try it at home. Learn how to get better with it. Do you know learning by doing. Which is very much a core tenet of Agile, but will can really help with Kanban. And this just doesn't help with Kanban. Really, if you're a developer out there, learn by doing. It's beautiful. Don't just work at work. Work at home too. But maybe work at, work at home doing something other than not work, or you will burn out. Yeah, right? do something fun at home. Yeah, like yeah. the reason most of I don't have anything and, and that's today out on GitHub is because most of the time my stuff is throwaway. Like I'm experimenting with. 
a function. Maybe I should start putting those up on GitHub, but why not? I, I don't. All right, Amy, you want to go? I'm going to go. Go, go ahead. You've right, got I'll keep like, going. You've got like 600 things listed well, there, so I'll go ahead and link. You know, we actually <laughs> wait. We, Becoming an Agile Family is that your website? No, no it says a, scrumfamily.wordpress.com, and we already know that I think that Scrum is is like not quite Agile. I, I agree. Okay. Anyway. It's just the neat idea. The guy's got to come up with really cool. his kid juice on his refrigerator. I've, okay, I've, check it out. If you oh, have kids. Wait, they're on his refrigerator. Okay, so now I'm going because I want to put a combine board on my refrigerator and have my kids use crayons on it and get <laughs> super excited about combine because that would be cool for me. I mean, my I have a three-year-old daughter and she, she's... Family tree bond with stars. Yeah. This is awesome. Yeah, see if you've got kids, check it out. Um, the other one I'll throw out there, because again, going with this combine, you know, this combine adoption, which, you know, we're starting very simple, a very much simplified version of our value stream. So, and we'll, we'll work to a more complicated version, but there's a great little tool out there, uh, by a company called Focused Objective. It's focusedobjective.com. You can build a Kanban workflow and then you can simulate changes to it and run that a Monte Carlo style simulation to see what the impacts of those changes are. That's kind of complicated. It, we'll put it on the show notes. Download the tool. It's fun to play with. Um, check it out. And my last two, since I picked too many, because we should do a show of nothing but picks, I think. Well, you already talked about Scaled Agile Framework. Well, I'm, just, I'm reminding you, folks, Scaled Agile Framework's really cool. Um, uh, it's actually really cool how it's being adjudicated, because it's a... I never knew you could put an Agile into a YOML diagram. Well, what, and what's really... I mean, the thing I'll plug about, you know, Dean Leffingwell and the Scaled Agile Framework is it's out there, it's available, check it out, use it. Um... Tool vendors who do Agile tools, Rally version one, they are aligning some of their future products to actually do some of the workflows needed to do it. But you don't have to buy into it. Um, they're selling training from the various partners who will teach you more about it. But you can self-educate with what's on the web, and there's actionable, usable information that if you learn it, you can benefit from moving out the next day. So, And you changed my... <laughs> I changed this David Anderson to Louis Anderson. Yeah, and I was again... Because I'm going to survey says on the board. Yeah. I can't do his voice. And He's trying to talk through my nose like that, but I can't do it. And in the spirit of combine, just now. talking about David Anderson's blog, agilemanagement.net. I'll change um, it back for you. No, that's fine. If you know that he had an interesting thing we didn't talk about, but again, if you're doing a combine adoption, a key thing to be mindful of is if you get feedback either from yourself or others that we're making things harder, that that's not right. Kanban should be a flowing transition. And if all of a sudden you feel like there are blocks or people don't get it, you're you're putting too much process in Amos. Yeah. So um it gets in your way. Yeah. It, which is funny because I get accused of my team having a lot of process, but every little piece of process that we got it was because we had a hard thing to deal with with the customer and we or with um, an integration point. And so we added to our Kanban and, and our process. But it was not until we had already had pain before we did that. Interesting. So, Lee, do you want to go next? or Actually, or I? I do have uh, a couple of picks. One, I already mentioned Work for Pi. I think that's a really cool idea. What did you say your score was again? I don't know. Oh. Did you did you go figure out yours yet? No, man, you guys. <sighs> I'm a nonconformist here. <laughs> I am gonna go to make sure Work for Pi pulls in things from like um uh, like the DISR, the Defense Information Systems Registry, and all this DARS, the Defense <laughs> Architecture Registry, so it can see my uh, my comments to a uh, big architecture framework. Well, they recently put in a feature for Work for Pi companies. But they don't actually have a score. I think they, they need to put in, if you, any of you guys are listening, um, put in a score for the entire company that, uh, that, uh, combines all of the scores for all of the people. Have you all seen Coderwall? I've yeah, not Coder seen Coderwall. Coderwall is the same thing. The same idea. Yeah, uh, a lot of the same idea. They don't have a cool pie thing. <laughs> um, the, the pie graph chart, chart thing is, is really kind of cool. Um, but the, uh, yeah, it's it's the same thing. You get a score, but they have a they, we have an asynchrony team out there, and the asynchrony team gets a conglomeration of your score and it Absolutely. orders it, and uh, it also has this thing. Pro tips is what they call it, which is mostly like tweets, only bigger, mm -hmm. and you can get points for pro tips too that people other people like, and so you tell them about when we do Kanban, we do this, or or here's a little short bash script that does this, and here's how it works, or whatever. That's cool. Yeah, cool. So my other pick was parse.com. 
If you haven't used it, if you're doing any type of mobile development, parse.com is an excellent API for allowing you to do cloud computing and, uh, uh, and file and data sharing across uh, across uh, your application without ever having to actually have your own server. Is, is it a distributed super cyber cloud? No. No! That's too many words. Uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. They have a really cool graphic on their front page, too. <laughs> <laughs> that's mine. Amos, hey, you've added pics! Woo! I keep adding pics because... Uh, the whole show should be nothing but pics. You guys have pics about about stuff. So so I went ahead and added Coder Wall since, since you said uh, work for Pi. I added Coder Wall because they're very similar, and mm-hmm. that way people know about both. Um, Rubular, which is, it's I've been using it for years. It's a website um, that you can put in a test string and a regular expression, and it just highlights the parts of the string that match that regular expression. It's really great whenever you're trying to fight some stuff, and it uses the Ruby regular expression syntax, um, which is... You know, most regular expression syntax is really close, so it's helpful everywhere. They're all based on, like, Perl 5, right? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> uh, it, actually, a regular expression looks a lot like a line of Perl. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and then here's here's a funny pick, Broke Back to the Future. Go to YouTube and look for... They have Broke Back to the Future, Broke Back Top Gun, and all kinds of stuff where they took... Uh, parts of the movie and edited together and made like a, a trailer for a new movie and broke back to the future is absolutely hilarious. Um, is it especially clean? if you're nerdy. Is it's, it clean it's, for an office no, no, environment? No, these are, yes, because they're all cut from the movie. So there's oh, okay. nothing bad. Okay. Like if you've seen Back to the Future, there's nothing really bad in there. They just cut like where one of the guys will turn and look at somebody else in, in awkward moments. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, and then the other thing was uh, send to Kendall. If you have a Kendall, this is the best thing that I've seen. Um, it's a pro, uh, it's a Chrome plugin from Amazon, and you can be on a website and like a blog, and you want to read it, and you want to finish reading it. You can't. You don't have time. Whatever. Or you just like reading on your Kindle, like I do, because I really like the screen instead of the backlit, like my monitor. Um, I say send to Kendall and it strips it down and you can even ask it for a preview before it sends it and it'll then send it to my Kindle next time I turn on the Wi-Fi on the Kindle. It's really, oh, that's cool. really sweet. And, yeah, I was asking how that, and the I'll... other cool thing is, is if you're on a blog that has like a lot of advertisements, they all go away because the only thing it gives you is the meat. Nice. Beautiful. Send to Kindle. Chrome plugin. Best free thing you'll ever spend your money on. Uh huh. Yeah, exactly. And we get back to an investment decision. That's right. Well, uh, since you did the intro, I'll do the outro. How about that? So um, this has uh, been a production of This Agile Life. Um, this is Amos, and you can find me at adkron, A-D-K-R-O-N, on GitHub and Twitter. And my two co-hosts, Jason Tice, go ahead. And tonight, your architecture commentary has been brought to you by Jason Tice. <laughs> Follow me on Twitter, although I haven't tweeted in a long time at Tice Thoughts. And the letter B. Brought to you by the letter B. <laughs> and Lee. I'm Lee McCauley, and you can find me at Agile Atheist on Twitter. Oh. And agileatheist.blogspot.com. Oh, wow. As my blog. Yep, 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 yep. Uh-huh. That's it. Uh-huh. <laughs> Thank so you. we'll be back in like two weeks One with moment. another really rigid Agile process, and we'll see you then. Oh, man. <laughs>